It's the year 2002, and with the Pokemon craze in full swing, a new phenomenon will be sweeping the nation, being Yu-Gi-Oh! Yu-Gi-Oh! in its simplest form is a card game where two or more players use a variety of monsters, spells, and trap cards to deal damage to their opponent's life points or bring their life points, and later on their bank accounts, to zero. Like any craze at the time, video games were bound to be introduced, and on March 19th, 2022, we were blessed with two being released. Yu-Gi-Oh! Dark's Duel Stories for the Game Boy Color, which plays very similar to the real-life card game TCG itself, with a few differences on important factors of types being a auto-win against the type they're strong against. However, today we're going to be discussing one of the other most beloved or hated Yu-Gi-Oh! games of all time, depending on who you may ask, being released on the same day. Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories for the PlayStation 1. You start off in the distant past as the Nameless Shadow, and is revealed in the anime and manga, his name is Atem. But for the sake of this video, eh, let's call him Protag. Protag is just a teenager who loves to play guard games. One night, he tries to sneak out only for his advisor to prevent him from leaving the palace. Forbidden Memories outside of duels is very similar to your current visual novel. Depending on your choices here, you can choose to either just run away, or after talking to him, he'll offer to duel you. You win, you get to go outside. He wins, you go to bed. After leaving, you head to the card shop meeting your friend Tiana, the past version of Taya Gardner. Yeah, it turns out all the main characters from the anime have past versions of themselves. We learn from Tiana there's a nearby festival. So being covered in drip, we go to the festival and find Juno, the past version of Joey Wheeler, losing against Priest Seto, the past version of Seto Kaiba. Defending Juno, Seto challenges us to a game, but is summoned to state we must finish this fight later on. Arriving back at the card shop, Seto arrives to challenge the pro tag. We defeat him gracefully, and he accepts his loss and returns home. As we sleep, the palace is attacked by Haishin, a high priest who wants nothing but the Millennium Items to obtain power to rule over Egypt. Or the world? I mean, with all that power, why would you stop at Egypt? Gotta set your eyes on bigger goals, my guy. Simon gives the puzzle during a conflict and tells you to run. Haishin stops you and challenges you to a children's card game because that's just how you handle highly problematic political concerns back in the day. Apparently. Once you lose, Simon convinces you to destroy the puzzle. By doing so, it traps Simon's and the pros tag soul into the puzzle. 5,000 years passes, a boy named Yugimoto receives a puzzle from his grandfather and puts it together and enters a Yu-Gi-Oh! tournament. Yeah, this is so young in the series, it's not even called Duel Monsters. Just Yu-Gi-Oh! So meta. Anyway, Yugi defeats all the characters from Season 1 in a glorious style and meets Shadi. Shadi informs Yugi that the, about the Spirit of the Millennium Puzzle and uses his own item, the Millennium Key, to show Yugi inside the puzzle. Within the puzzle, Yugi meets Protag, who gives him six blank cards. Not sure what to use him for, Yugi enters the next leg of the tournament. Now, in this universe, every round two finalist has a Millennium item in the semifinals. Once Yugi beats Bakura, Seto Kaiba, Pegasus, and Ishizu, and then Shadi himself, not in this order, the Millennium items get absorbed into the cards given to Yugi. When Yugi defeats Kaiba and receives the final one, he releases the spirit of the puzzle back into his own world. Now free, Protag heads to his home to see it destroyed along with the old card shop. Simon informs us what has happened. Haishin has taken over the kingdom with his forces using the power of the Millennium Items, and we need to feed his forces to reclaim the items and the very country back itself. Protag bumps into Juno who takes him to the new hidden card shop where he encounters familiar faces. Heading back to our destroyed palace, we find a map and return back to the Valley of Kings, where we find a friend of the royal family who takes us to the Forbidden Runes using the map that we found. Soon after, we obtain a map of all the shrines where Haishin's mages are located, specializing in a monster type and a field power bonus. During our quest reclaiming the Millennium Items, Juno, by returning to the card shop, informs us that Tiana was kidnapped by Seto Kaiba as a mean of abstraction. So after going through a labyrinth, we challenge Seto himself to 
save Tiana, and then we resume back to our quest of reclaiming the Millennium items from Haitian's generals. Once we defeat each of the mage generals, reclaiming each item, we head back to the shrine to reclaim our land. However, standing before the end of the game is the dreaded Final Six. This is a back-to-back -back dual gauntlet of the six strongest duelists in the game. Starting with the lackeys, we have Neku and Deku, followed by Haishin himself, Seto Kaiba, and then shortly after defeating Haishin and Seto, Haishin uses Seto's life as a bargaining tool, reclaims the Millennium items from us, and summons Dark Knight, a formidable foe who realizes Haishin was not the true owner of the Millennium items, and seals him into a playing card and then calls him too weak for a spot in his deck and burns it on the spot in front of our very eyes. I mean, I find this part rather ironic. Haitian kind of deserved it. Anyways, armed with the true authority and ownership of the Millennium Items, we get to challenge Dark Knight and defeat him. Insanely pissed off after losing when just coming back to the living world, he magically transforms into Nightmare and challenges us once again. Upon defeating him a second time, we get the longest no in visual novel history to date. We claim our land being named the best pharaoh in history. So for the story itself, it's passable for what you'd expect from a game this time. You're gonna be focusing more on the gameplay itself, but having some nods to characters that show up in the manga of the anime is a treat. Now, let's talk about gameplay. For the most part, it's standard Yu-Gi-Oh. However, let's talk about some of the main difference. So your deck must be 40 cards, unlike the real game where it could be between 40 and 60 cards. You start the game by drawing five cards. You can only play one card from your hand per turn. However, you can fuse multiple monsters together, not needing polymerization. And then finally, when you start your turn, you draw cards into your hand until you have five, which is something that wouldn't be reintroduced until 20 years later, with Konami making the spin-off style of Yu-Gi-Oh being Rush Duels. So in a sense, Forbidden Memory lives on with the idea brought into modern Yu-Gi-Oh playstyles. Now, I did just say you technically only play one card per turn. That's kind of true, but kind of not. So you can choose to fuse multiple monsters in your hand and they all go through the sequence where if they're compatible, they'll create a new monster and then you'll end up with that one card and play it on the field. Also, at the end of your sequence, if you have compatible spell cards, they'll be equipped to the monster boosting its stats. So technically you can play multiple cards, but ultimately when it comes with your turn, you can realistically only drop one card onto the field at a time. There are no effect monsters in this game, so to supplement effects you need powerful monsters, which is where the fusion comes in. And let's explain to the best of my ability. So you take two monsters and you throw them together and if it's compatible you make a monster. Well how do you know what's compatible? <laughs> you kinda gotta figure it out, like for example if you take a thunder creature and a dragon, it'll make Thunder Dragon. And then if you add another Thunder or a Dragon type on top of it, it should make Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon. So essentially, you kind of need to know what cards already are in the game and two lesser parts to ultimately make the creature. It's a bit hard to explain at first, but as you start building your deck and finding the fusion results, it gets easier. And again, you can also fuse up to five cards at once, so this is a great way to drop powerful monsters, to deplete your hand, to drop the five on your follow-up turn, but also to go through the experimenting to see what makes something and what does not. Traps are extremely powerful in this game and activate upon a condition with no free will. If the condition for a trap is met, it's going to activate, so you have no control on that. So it really benefits you to have a lot of monsters that are default compatible with each other. A very safe and common route for this game is a deck full of dragons and thunder types to make twin into thunder dragon as consistent as possible, due to being at 2,800 attack on its own, which is quite respectable. And then you can augment it with spell cards such as Megamorph, Bright Castle, Horn of Light, and supplement with traps as well. 
building your ideal deck isn't that hard to do considering there's less than 800 cards in the game but the real problem with this game is the consistency of getting the most powerful cards or the cards for synergy you see you get one card in the game when you defeat someone however the game doesn't provide any idea of what character drops or the likelihood of receiving said cards in terms of monsters you can expect rex raptor to drop dinosaurs and some dragons so having some knowledge on the manga or the anime will give you an idea of who to farm what for however for the generic spells and traps that are needed in the late game it's a free for all on how to who to farm this turns a very fast paced version of Yu-Gi-Oh into a standstill due to spending hours trying to farm a character for a certain card that you may or may not end up knowing that they have if you plan on playing this game i would suggest looking to some fan mods out there some mods increase the drops from five cards to 10 cards to 15 which makes farming so much more tolerable since you get a much bigger picture of what to go after one or two games as just oppose and hope you get something good plus trying to get multiple copies of lower power cards is just ideal in this setting for your fusion plays of course the internet is also a fantastic resource for character drops at what rank of tech or pow so please use them to your heart's content now personally i love this game to death i've played it numerous times especially the high drop rate ones since it's somewhat therapeutic and kind of like how shiny hunters sit through the grind this is the same way but is this game perfect oh hell no not at all so aside from the problems with the base game just having one drop rates that take forever to build a powerful deck the game is somewhat against you remember how i explained fusion to you what if i told you the game doesn't do that the game treats the player as if they already knew how to play the game now normally for a video game adaptation of a card game this wouldn't be so bad since the information from the tcg should transfer to here what some of it does but it doesn't in forbidden memories you don't tribute monsters for tribute summons you're limited to playing one card off from your hand to the field per turn fusions are vastly different and are more now reminiscent of what they are in today's game and of course you don't require polymerization and you draw up to five cards one of the main reasons why this is the case is because they were still fleshing out the card game into the from the manga adaptation into real life but still it's vastly different and the game itself doesn't really tell you all about this at all they expect you to either know how to play the game already or to read through the manual and back in 2002 yeah we didn't really do that too much it would have been nice if the game had an in-game tutorial to kind of show you the ropes on how things work however i digress another gameplay mechanic i didn't mention was the guardian signs think of these as like type advantages if you play pokemon every card has two guardian signs modeled after the planets in the solar system each one is strong against another and weak against another you must select one of them before you place your monster onto the battlefield the game itself doesn't tell you what these are why they matter or the affinity charts i believe it's included in the manual for the game which granted at least they were giving some information on the word to find it however i feel like the game should have had a tutorial section to expand more upon this for a quick hypothetical example let's say you summon a monster in the sun guardian star if it battles against a monster in the moon guardian star the sun creature will gain 500 additional attack essentially during damage calculation which makes a huge difference like sometimes it could be life or death when it comes to the guardian side especially in the later game because you want to make your creatures as powerful as possible as soon as possible and having the guardian signs gives you a somewhat better way to protect yourself when your opponent starts dropping gate guardians or meteor black dragons some of these insanely powerful cards that if you have know the right guardian sign it gives you just a slight advantage to be able to survive against the onslaught one last thing i guess i can also talk about here that is going to be very beneficial for when you're first starting building off your deck is the password system you see after every duel you do get a ranking based on your performance along with a card drop but you also get amount of star chips equivalent to your rank one through five the better you do the more star chips you get you can then go into the main menu section of the title screen and then use 
the star chips you accumulate for passwords to redeem for cards. Now, don't get your hopes up with these because some of the costs are ridiculous. You're generally gonna spend more of your time using the star chips to get weak monsters that you can use for fusion into stronger monsters, such as getting a lot of dragons and thunders to make thunder dragon to then lead on into twin headed thunder dragon. It's not a very feasible way to get good cards. Again, the password system could just be a great way to fill in the spaces for your fusion materials to be able to build your ultimate end goal for what you want your deck to accomplish. Aside from the campaign and of course the password system, there is also another section in free duel where you can duel pretty much anybody you've encountered during your campaign and duel them as many times as you need to without the risk of worrying about getting a game over and starting up your most recent save load. You are going to be spending probably more time in the free duel section than you will in the campaign just because of how many times you have to grind these characters. Look at some of these match numbers and this is still me as a recording before the final six there is a lot of duels that are required here just to hopefully get the dropouts that you want again this is me playing the vanilla version this is me still keeping my sanity from playing the vanilla version so again if you happen to get a mod that allows you to increase the drop rate to 5 10 or 15 i would recommend to do it probably the 10 or 5 spot because that just gives you enough challenge and consistency while 15 just feels a bit too much. One more thing I will mention before we go to our recap section is that this is one of the more challenging Yu-Gi-Oh games to play until you kind of become familiar with the system. So again, kind of getting the whole fusion mechanic and making your deck as compatible with any number of possibilities as possible is going to be very beneficial. Early on, I mentioned trying to go for the Thunders and Dragons. However, if you can't ultimately end up doing that, consider splicing in some other creatures that are compatible with dragons, such as the rock type, which can make stone D, which then can fuse into twin ended thunder dragon. Same idea by adding plants, which a plant and a dragon will make black jungle dragon king, which then another thunder on top of that will make twin headed thunder dragon. So ultimately just trying to have a lot of creatures in your deck that are compatible with each other will make the game much more easier because your fusion plays will be much more consistent, which means you get to drop powerful monsters sooner, and of course, drawing more cards, just helping fuel the constant grind. All in all, Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories is a very unique take on the card game that has evolved into today, while they were still trying to get the card game running. It's a bit fast paced compared to most Yu-Gi-Oh! card games for video game adaptations out there due to the lack of chain links really being a thing. It's a much more stripped down version of Caveman Yu-Gi-Oh where you make the biggest monster you can then just start swinging for damage. Plus with a very unique and great soundtrack. I'm sorry. The soundtrack for Forbidden Memories is amazing. It's one of my personal favorite ones. And if you're a part of my Yu-Gi-Oh card game TCG channel, you'll often hear quite a bit of the OST in like the background music because I just love it so much. But yes, with Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories, it is a bit of a challenge. There's a bit of a learning curve. There is also a grind that is to be held there due to the vanilla version. Drop rates are so garbage and you're only getting one card per drop. However, I still would recommend to anybody who loves the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG to give this game a shot. Or even if you like card games in general, it's still a fun time. Again, if you play the vanilla version like I have been slaving over, it's going to be taking a little bit more time to get the cards you need to. But when you do, it feels pretty damn good. However, if you want a more relaxed approach, again, there are mods out there that increase the drop rate from 5 to 10 to 15 instead of the base 1. Just helps speed up everything considerably and makes it a much more relaxing and fun experience. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to me talk about one of my favorite PlayStation 1 games for about 20 minutes now. Uh, this video was actually very much... 50-50 on script and unscripted. As I was writing the script, just more and more ideas came into mind, and I kind of felt like being a game I played so many times, it might just be a bit more authentic if I just spoke as to the heart, of course. Let me know down below if you're gonna give this game a shot or if you've already given the game of a shot to it, if you like it or hate it, because again, this is one of the games where it's very divisive. Don't forget to subscribe for more awesome content, and I will catch you guys later. Peace.